So we've been talking about this series, Advent series. This is the third installment in the, in the series, next Sunday or Christmas Eve. And why do we have these stories? Why do we have any of the narratives in the Bible? It's not just to fill in the book like a lot of modern, uh, modern authors, but it's actually so that we can look at the story and put ourselves into the story and find out what God wants to say to us that we should maybe do. Some are just descriptive of things so that kind of reads, but a lot of times it's prescriptive. We can look at the history. We can look at things. We can see how people responded to God and say, huh, that's me there. I would have done the same thing. God might have said the same thing to me. So the character in today's story is a guy named Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was, as Nick said a few weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, he was a priest. And there were a lot of priests and only so many opportunities for every priest to burn incense in the temple. And so they had a lottery system. Zechariah was an old man, and he had won the lottery, meaning he got to go into the temple and burn the incense. And this was a huge, this was the moment of his lifetime. And while he's in there, an angel shows up, Gabriel. And they always start off, don't be afraid, it's okay. Because that would be one of those moments when you're really glad you had on dark slacks. It would just, <laughs> and he says, fear not. I've been sent to give you good news. You're going to have a son. Now, Zachariah was married to Elizabeth, and they were both beyond childbearing years by double. And he gets, Gabriel kind of gets the same reaction that Sarah had when she got the news. She and Abraham, yeah, right, and she laughs. But instead, Zachariah says, how am I supposed to know that? And I love, this is one of the best lines in the Bible, except the serious ones. <laughs> Gabriel says, my name's Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. Be quiet. And he was, for the pregnancy term plus eight days. Couldn't talk. Mute. Couldn't talk if he wanted to. So the story starts in, in this passage of Scripture, in verse 57 of chapter 1 of Luke, was read earlier. It's now the day to name the baby. It's the day of circumcision. It's eight days after the birth. This little baby boy has no idea what's coming. And they're going to name him in the tradition. No. The crowd and the friends say, Liz, Elizabeth, we were good friends, so I call her Liz, says, what are you going to name him? John. John. It's supposed to be Zach Jr. So they look at Zachariah and said, what's up? So he asked for a tablet and gets a tablet and he writes out John. And as soon as he was in obedience to what Gabriel told him the baby's name was, his mouth opened up and he began to praise God. What makes you break into song? I have asked me, myself that question for two weeks. And you know what? It's been a long time since I was so overwhelmed I started to sing. Think about it in your own life. The pace that we live, the things we get wrapped up in, When's the last time you just could not contain yourself and you broke into song? I can't remember the last time. And this song of Zechariah is here so that you and I can look at our lives and wonder and ask, do I have the same response to Jesus? Do I have the same response to being able to talk about Jesus as John had? Because that's what we have. Their history, this narrative, 
is ours. This is easily you and me. Now, what did Zechariah know that the people around him didn't know? Well, he was a priest, and so he knew what the scrolls said. He had studied. He knew that God had promised a lot more to his people than what had happened. He knew that in Genesis 22, 17, that God and Abram had had this conversation. And God had gone to this guy and he said, I need you to follow me. Now it says Abraham followed other religions. He didn't know who God was, but God knew who he was. He picked him and said, follow me. So Abraham picks up his stuff and follows God. And along the way, God makes this covenant with him. And he says, I will bless you and I will multiply your offspring as the stars in the heaven and the sands in the seashore. That's a lot of people. And that's the promise we're still living in. There have been billions of Christians, people who follow Jesus since that promise was given. It still is being fulfilled. But at that moment in Zechariah's life, it hadn't happened yet. There was still something missing. And it says the Holy Spirit had come up on Zechariah and had given him something to speak of, to ponder that was present but was still prophetic. He knew that the nation of Israel had just gone through the darkest period in history. If you know about the nation of Israel, they didn't come back into being until 1947, but way back then, they were a people that were rebellious. They were God's chosen people though, and he kept after them. He was Per relentless, pursued them through thick and thin. And they kept rejecting. They kept wanting more. They wanted their own things. And so finally they go into captivity, go into Babylon. And they're held and they're enslaved, finally released, and then God goes silent on them. And it was a dark period in history. But Isaiah the prophet had said in 60 verses 2 and 3, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and darkness over the people. But the Lord will arise upon you. And the nations shall come to you, come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your arising. But Zach looked around and all he saw were Roman soldiers. It hadn't happened yet. There had to be something still to come. God had promised an end to the darkness. He also knew that Isaiah 9-2 had said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. There's going to be something that will change. And he knew these promises had to happen at some point because God had said them through the prophets. What are the things in your life that you know God has said to you? And it's, they're not present. And yet, we have these stories to show that when God says, when he declares, it does come around. It's in God's time. And Zechariah knew that. And he pursued in that. God had promised a king that would rule out of the house of David. Jeremiah 23, 5, and 6. And there had been a lot of kings since David. Solomon was a good king. He fulfilled part of this prophecy, but not the all, because the ends with, he will be the Lord who is our righteousness. And Solomon fell short that. He was wise. There were other kings. There were other bad kings that led into exile. So there was still something out there that he hoped for. And he knew that in, in Malachi, unless you're from the south, that's the book called Malachi. But he knew that God had promised healing. It was read as the Old Testament reading today. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise up with healing in its rays. And they heard these things metaphorically. On this side of history, we look back and we know that that was Jesus. And when Zechariah's mouth 
or when he wrote the name, it says that, oops, it says that his mouth was immediately opened and he began to praise the Lord. But the people that were watching it filled them with awe and probably some fear and confusion. And they asked this question, with all this going on, what then will this child be? There's two songs, and they start in verse 67. The first is we call the Benedictus, and it's just a hymn of thanksgiving. When the Holy Spirit engaged Zechariah, he began to sing praises to God, and that's the Benedictus. He began to sing praises of this embryonic child, Jesus, who was going to be born a few months after his own son, and it was going to be amazing. There would be redemption, and it hadn't happened at the moment, but prophetically, he spoke it because it was in process. Thirty-three years later, it would be fulfilled. The cross would be born. Death and the resurrection, and death would be trampled. But he begins by crying out loud, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. That's something that we can say. It's something that the world at Christmas time sings, but it's our song. It was Zachariah's song that day. This Redeemer Jesus was going to do everything that God had wanted for them but had failed at individually and as a nation, as a people. Jesus came not to make them great, but because he is great and they in him were safe. He was everything they couldn't be, faithful, forgiving, merciful, gracious, some of you know I've spent most of my adult life in pain from two different accidents, a boating accident and a construction accident. It broke lower vertebrae in my back and crushed inner vertebrae in my neck. And because of medical procedures and stuff, I've had intermittent seasons of, of no pain. They burn through nerves and then you just can't feel it. It's present, but you don't have to react to it. And I just had that done a few weeks ago, but the week before that, I had had enough. I've learned to be fairly resilient, but there are moments when it's, it's overwhelming. If you know anybody or you live in chronic pain yourself, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's very real. And I just, I told Estel, I said, I, I, I don't want to wake up tomorrow morning in pain. I don't want to go to, a, to sleep because of a drug-induced sleep. I want, I'm done. I can't do this. And she did as she does. She held me, began to pray. She didn't pray that I would be healed. She prayed that Jesus would be my strength, that Jesus would be my peace, that he would be everything I couldn't be right then. Because, see, that's who Jesus is. He is the perfecter of the faith. He is our peace. And I failed. My body was failing. But in Christ and in his presence, I slept so well that night. And I was just reminded once again, it's not about our ability to attain. It's about him. It's about what he did attain and who he is and who he is in our present. Israel, how many times did they fail? When God had led them across the Red Sea and, and out of Egypt, and he crushed the Egyptian army, when Moses is receiving the law, they're down there building a golden image so they would have something to worship that was visible like other countries did. They wanted a king because other countries get kings. Why don't we? All we got's the creator of the universe. Until finally it was enough. 
And God said, fine, I'll give you what you can do on your own. And it was captivity. And it was silence from God. And many of us in this room did what we could do. And the buzz and the party led to an alcohol problem. The flirting, the office led to an affair. The climbing the social ladder, the public ladder, the job ladder, led to a mortgage that can't be handled. We get entrapped in these little things, and pretty soon we forget that God has given us and called us to a different way of life, and all of a sudden it's staring us in the face. And then God does something unique, and he sends us a John, who's actually the name means God is gracious. And he gives us mercy. Where justice should be demanded, God says, I love you too much. I choose to be gracious and give you what you don't deserve and be merciful and not give you what you do deserve. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's what he came to do as a redeemer. This redeemer was going to honor the covenant that he knew Abram had done with God in Genesis 22, 17. That there were still blessings to be had. There were still people to collectively come together as this church. He knew those. He didn't understand them, but the Holy Spirit had given him a prompting that God was about to break in in a different way. Just as he had broken into Abraham's life and pulled him away, he was going to break in and do something different. But all they had was their traditions. All they had was the way it had been. But the Spirit was speaking that there was new life about to happen. There was a light that was going to happen in the darkness. The Redeemer would not rule in fear. It wouldn't look like the Roman century. It wouldn't look like the centurion that, that made the life miserable for so many. Instead, this Redeemer would be holy. He would be righteous. He would rule in love. This Redeemer would rescue and redeem his people. This Redeemer that he talked about, that God had blessed us with, is our Redeemer. It's Jesus. The reason he broke into song is because he understood what Jesus was going to do, what Jesus has done for us was announced 2,000 years and 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And that's what we can sing about, should we choose to. And Zechariah goes on then in the next three verses, and he begins to talk about his son, John, he and Elizabeth had. In keeping, John was going to be a prophet. He was going to be a prophet in the Nazarite tradition, which meant he was raised in obscurity. When he was old enough, he went to live in the wilderness only to worship God. That was his only thing that he could do, live off the land, uh, fermented juice could not cross his lips, couldn't cut his hair. He had one purpose, and that was to herald the things of God. And he was to be silent until it was time. Jesus said that John was the greatest prophet, likely because he heralded Jesus himself. The people would be rescued. That was his message. Not from civil or tyrannical rule, no oppression, but from their own sin. Mercy would replace what justice demanded. And he would proclaim that those who were doomed to death, they heard probably from the Roman's hand, but we know it was spiritual death, from serving self, from being entrapped, enslaved, 
instead of this life of liberty, freedom. So that's Zachariah's song, but what is our song today? Jesus has come to redeem his created but sinful people, you and I. Now, most of us in this room are redeemed. What that means for those of you that may not be or looking at church and wondering why in the world do we get up and come out on a snowy morning and gather together is that we came to a crossroads where we said, I can't do this any longer. What I'm doing in my life track just isn't working. I need a different people. I need a different way. I need redeemed. I need made new. And that's a choice that we made. But like anything, when we make choices, we get used to those choices, and we sometimes forget the significance of that moment. Remember when you said that to Jesus, I need you? That was a moment you probably wanted to break out into song. That was a moment when life changed. This Jesus who lived a life like ours, died a death that we don't have to, rose from the dead and defeating everything that Satan had prescribed for us, for you, me. In the domain of the world, this evil that was broken into that Christmas would no longer rule those who chose to believe in Jesus. It exists, but it no longer has the power to consume unless we allow it. Because the blood of Jesus was enough to sever everything, every curse, every litany that Satan had against us over. And God would now bring a new kind of prosperity not one that the Romans could conquer or be stamped on a coin, but one that lived inside, one that allowed peace, one that allowed forgiveness, one that allowed mercy and grace. And that's our song, that Jesus opens eyes so that we can see truth, so we can understand we can be rescued, we can be redeemed, we can be liberated. And Zechariah had a song about John. The worship team's going to come up, and we're going to sing a song in just a moment. Then I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk a little bit more. But we have to remember that those messages are our messages. Today, we look at the message about John from our perspective. John's message was, there's one coming that's greater than I. I can baptize in water, but he will baptize in spirit and in truth. That's the message that we have. We can prepare the way of rescue, of salvation for those around us, just like Rick talked about. Now, I had a mentor, several, that raised Estelle and I up in the faith in ministry in our young years. And a lot of the habits that I have today, 30 some years later, are just habits that they instilled in me, beat in me, cajoled me if I didn't, and they kind of become part of what I do. And sometimes I don't even think about those things. Um, Friday, um, I had a little bag of jewelry Estelle had cleaned out a drawer or something and, and was just cleaning out some rings that didn't fit anymore, some things her mom gave her, various things, and ended up in a little baggie. So what's that? Well, it's jewelry that needs fixed or doesn't fit. And so I took him to a jeweler. I don't know anybody here that's a jeweler, so I was, kind of went through, popped up Google Map, which said, jeweler near me, one pops up. This is how innocent God works. I go in, he says, we introduce small talk. He says, uh, what do you do? So I'm one of the pastors over at High Point Church. Oh, my mom goes over there. She's been over there forever. Owned the jewelry store in Middleton, and now I've got the jewelry store. Um, it's going well. 
I said, oh, so you live around here? He says, well, I'm getting married. Fiance's up north. We're, she's coming down. We're going to buy a house in Middleton. I just got an apartment now. And I said, well, if your mom comes to High Point, you probably should too. And he goes, yeah, that's what my mom says. And I said, well, if you're getting married, here's my card. Give me a call. I'll do you premarital, marry you. You can meet some people at High Point, and we'll live merrily ever, ever after. And he's like, okay. He said, that's kind of strange because we had already talked about going back to church. But we know where we wanted to go because we don't know any church people. I said, well, now you do. <laughs> Out the door. From there, I went to, to a Home Depot and got a couple things. And I'm coming out, and it's a classic Christmas scene. It's probably something you see in a movie or something. Here's an older couple with a in, brand new in, Infiniti G35. Beautiful little car. Trying to stuff a Christmas tree in it. So I watched him for a little bit and could tell it wasn't quite going to work. Two guys from Home Depot are hanging on each end of the tree just waiting to find out what's going on. I walked over and I said, that's probably not going to work. Keen sense for the obvious. I've got a truck. Where do you live? Oh, down by McKee Park. It's okay. We can do it. I said, I live just north of there and I'm headed home. Why don't you let them throw it in my truck? I'll follow you. Kind of looked at me like, you going to steal my tree? <laughs> but he said, I'm Joel. I said, I'm Mike. Your tree's okay. He said, okay. So he gets in his car. The Home Depot guys throw it in my truck. They kind of look at me sideways like, Hoo, doo, 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 and back in the store. So we get over to his house. I said, you want help carrying it in? He goes, man, that'd be great. The tree's a little bigger than this guy. And... We go in, and at a stopway on the way, I had just pulled a card out of my pocket and wrote Merry Christmas on it, my business card. So we're done delivering the tree, and I said, hey. Or he goes, he said, thank you, you're a good Samaritan. I said, no, this is just God saying to you, he loves you right now. Handed him my card, said Merry Christmas. Head out back through the garage door. He says, wait. I turn and said, What? He said, anything you need? I said, no. But if you need anything else, please use the number on the card. Love to help you. And left. I have no idea what God's doing. But that's not my job. My job and your job is to simply do what John did, and that's to herald the good news that there's a God who loves we have stories of forgiveness. We have stories of grace and mercy in our lives that we can talk about. That God wants us to talk about. He wants us to use. And we can speak of this peace that replaces the, the lies and, and the, the stigma and the shame of life. That's gone. It's over. We have a new song to sing. We have the ability to do it differently. We're going to sing a song, and as we sing it, I want you to ask yourself this question, right back where we started. What makes you break into song? Let's stand.